Sure, it's a bit nerdy of me, but I just can't help it. It's in my nature to want to know what works and what doesn't and how I can do better, which is good news for you, right? More of what you want to hear and know and less of what you don't. Your time is precious, especially engaged time that goes past faster than the last two days of a holiday. If I had a quick look at who you are and where you come from on my podcast analytics this week. And I wanted to let you know a few exciting highlights that I think you'll love as well. The Unbridly Modern Wedding Planning Podcast has been heard in 56 countries and 823 cities around the world, which blows my mind, but also confirms that our obsession, yours and mine, with creating a wedding that means something and is more about your relationships and how it feels than the conspicuous consumption to please social media algorithms, it's real and it's valuable. And it's a drive and a value that is not just particular to me or my wedding vendor colleagues here in my hometown of Adelaide, South Australia, but much wider too. So thank you. A big shout out to those listeners in Seattle and New York who are the fastest growing cities. This means you are sharing the podcast with your like-minded, engaged friends, which is freaking awesome. And also to those in the United Kingdom, Canada, and New Zealand, who are, after Australia and the States, the fastest growing countries. Thank you. As always, I am here to listen to what you want to need, like at any time. So you can reach me via DM on Instagram at Unbridly. You can email me or what I really love most is you can send me a 90 second audio message via SpeakPipe because I get to hear your voice and your accent and I can really connect with you and your point of view and serve you better. The links are in the show notes and don't be shy. It's just you and me and I seriously want to hear from you. What's all this for if I can't help with what's really bothering you about your wedding planning? Tell me everything. So on to this week's episode, which is basically about your wedding budget, saving, keeping costs down, how and where to save, and a few ideas in between. Personally, and I'm sure you're not shocked, I've got strong views about saving money on your wedding. In my time in weddings, events, hospitality, and now as a celebrant, I've seen hundreds, possibly thousands of couples now struggle and worry about their money and the cost of certain products and services. Some get it right, and by right, I mean that they have the wedding they want at a cost they can live with, while others are crushed and jaded by the entire experience. And this matters. If you go back and have a listen to episode 22, I mention a survey by The Lending Tree about wedding debt and the knock-on effects to your relationship. 45% of the respondents said that they went into debt for their wedding. And 76% of those who went into debt for their wedding say they argued about wedding-related expenses with their fiancé, which is compared with only 20% of those who avoided wedding debt. So making sure you have a wedding budget and are tracking expenses in a way that you're both happy with is crucial to a great wedding, for sure. But even more so to the health and longevity of your marriage. So if you're planning the most epic party of your life, but feeling the budget blues, I got you. Because in this episode, I'm going to give you the insider tips and tricks you need to have your cake and eat it too, pun intended. So whether you're a penny-pinching type of planner across the board, or you're just looking for some creative, cost-cutting ideas in a specific area of your wedding, you want to listen up. Today, I'm going to share info about your wedding budget and how it's not a fixed number that you set when you get engaged and never think about again, how you can prioritize where you're going to spend your hard-earned money while still sticking by your values, the age-old question of DIY or amateur versus hiring a professional vendor, and creative ways to make your dollar stretch further. Money, I know, is almost always a sensitive topic. But I feel in today's economic climate, there's an extra sense of pressure. And so this chat is important, timely, and I'll try to keep it as light as possible too. Let's get into this. 
Unbridly is a community of pro wedding vendors who believe in freedom and integrity in weddings, giving you options, solutions, tips and tricks to create the experience and memories that you and your fiancé really want and deserve. Because we believe that weddings are a team sport. With how-tos, stories and interviews with recently married couples, we find out what went right and what they'd change if they could go back and do it all over again. I'm Camille and welcome to the Unbridly podcast. Spending guilt is not just reserved for those packages that arrive from your late night online shopping adventures. And for your wedding, there are higher stakes involved too. Wedding budgeting, saving where you can, being thrifty, whatever you want to call it, it's important to how you feel in the process of your wedding planning. And let's face it, that's generally somewhere between 6 to 12 to 18 months of your life. It's also going to affect your wedding day and how you feel on the day. Those little twinges of guilt, you know, when that package arrives at your front door. If you're not truly happy with the purchasing decisions and the booking decisions that you've made for your wedding day, those little pangs of guilt will hit you throughout the day and beyond as well. So I know having these discussions can be uncomfortable, they can be tough and frequently emotional, but definitely in a long-term relationship essential to work out what you both want and how you're going to get there together. Now, the big bonuses of saving your money, as in not spending them on things that you don't value, is you've got more of your hard-earned dosh that can go towards other things. And I'm looking at you, honeymoon and home deposit. You also may be able to stretch your dollar further and add special touches to your wedding day that you might not have otherwise been able to afford. You may get to have your wedding sooner. You might be able to bring it forward and not have to wait a year or two years until you can afford it. And you may be able to fit onto your guest list those couple of guests that you really feel bad about not being able to invite at your current budget. The downsides of trying to save a buck comes down to that idea of the false economy. So in project management, there's a triangle. (laughs) Stick with me here. It's called the iron triangle, or sometimes it's referred as pick two. So if you imagine a 2D triangle, like, you know, just the outline of a triangle, one side is labeled time or speed. One side is labeled cost or price. And the third is labeled quality. Now, the theory is that you can pick two of these attributes when you book a service or buy a product, but you can never have all three. As in something that's cheaper may have issues with quality or may take more of your time. So if you think, you know, something like assembling IKEA furniture, it takes your time, takes your frustration. So while DIY can help to reduce your monetary costs and outlays in the short term, there's invisible costs of your valuable time and noticeable and sometimes regretful reduction in quality, which may add up to a false economy in the long run. This is why I'll always advocate for a smart allocation of your budget ahead of cost cutting by buying cheap products or hiring cut price wedding vendors. Smart allocation of budget, of course, means you value it. So the stuff you really like, you drop your money on and the stuff that you don't give a shit about, you don't. If you're like a lot of my listeners, you're probably also looking for ways to save money without sacrificing your sense of style or your big three non-negotiable expenses, or your personal values. Being eco-friendly, for example, shopping local or inclusive, are not just catchphrases or marketing slogans. You want to be able to carry these through into these decisions with your wedding as well. So the first thing you're going to be doing is setting your budget. So before you start planning your wedding, you need to determine the money, and it needs to be based in reality first. You should start by working out how much money you've got coming in. What's your income? How much have you saved? How much are you willing to spend on your wedding? You should also work out what aspects of the wedding are most important to you and allocate the majority budget to those. You're not going to be spending an equal amount on everything. And you also don't need to adhere to these arbitrary percentage breakdowns of quite frequently weddings that happened 20 to 30 years ago or or weddings that are costed on a completely different scale to what you're doing. 
So one great tool you can use to help you stick to your budget is using a wedding budget calculator. These are widely available online and can help you keep track of what you're spending. You can set your budget in these and they'll break down how much you can afford to spend on each aspect of your wedding. But as I said, what I find is that they are fundamentally flawed because each category, let's say venue, catering, dress, photographer, DJ, etc., assumes a percentage breakdown that A, might not be accurate for where you're having your wedding. So think country town in the middle of Australia versus destination wedding in Bali versus upscale wedding in New York. The different locations of these weddings will have a different associated market cost. And B, it doesn't take into account what kind of celebration you're having. In this example, renting fancy cutlery and napkins, linens, is not required for your festival vibe food truck wedding. And C, it doesn't take into account your values. If you, my friend, want to drop $15,000 on your wedding dress, but serve your guests pizza in a field, that's your fucking prerogative. Something as simple as a spreadsheet, where you can put in the specific products and services that you want and allocate your budget across those categories makes so much sense. The next step is prioritizing those expenses. Some expenses are more important than others. And guess who gets to choose that? You do. So you should focus your budget on these areas. So for example, if you care more about having excellent food and drinks, you should allocate more of your budget to catering. But if you're more interested in having beautiful flowers, fresh flowers everywhere, you want to allocate more of your budget to decor. Another way to save money on your wedding, at least by, you know, when you talk to your relatives, uh, your auntie will come up with this solution, sometimes parents do, sometimes well-meaning friends, is by doing things yourself. Because the theory is that there's a large markup or wedding tax applied to products and services that come from wedding vendors. And for more on this, please go back, listen to episode 26 called The wedding tax is absolutely real and here's how you can avoid it. Yeah, there's a lot more information about the wedding tax in there. But when we're talking about DIY or uh, amateurs versus hiring wedding professionals, I have so many thoughts on this and it may well be an entire topic and podcast episode all of its own with my personal DIY wedding efforts, successes and failures aside, I would seriously advise you to consider the consequences of taking on large, complex or important DIY projects for your wedding with a healthy helping of caution. While it might be tempting to DIY certain aspects of your wedding to save money, it's important to consider the false economy of doing so. While it might seem cheaper at first glance, the costs can quickly add up and the quality of the end result may not be quite what you hoped for. When it comes to certain aspects of your wedding, like catering, photography, and floral arrangements, it's best to leave it to the professionals. These wedding suppliers have had years of experience and expertise in their respective fields, and they know how to execute your vision flawlessly. This saves you time. Believe it or not, it saves you money, and it also takes stress off your shoulders. Additionally, By hiring these professionals, you'll have peace of mind on your big day, knowing that everything is taken care of. You won't have to worry about unexpected issues arising or last-minute mishaps as your vendors will have a plan in place to handle any situation that may arise. While hiring professionals may seem like a larger upfront cost, it can actually save you money in the long run by preventing costly mistakes and ensuring that everything runs smoothly. There's also this domino effect in a wedding where if one supplier is running late, it can knock on to the next supplier. And if you don't have professionals who have experience in this and who can solve problems on the fly, that's when your wedding and especially your timeline can become very crunchy. So before you decide to DIY aspects of your wedding, be sure to weigh up the costs and consider the benefits of hiring a professional. If you do decide to hire professionals, wedding vendors who do it week in, week out, you can still save money by being strategic. For example, some wedding vendors change their prices every year. And if you book 
before a certain date, before that price rise comes into effect, then essentially you're booking them for their lower rate on your date. And then finally, let's discuss some creative ways to save money on your wedding. Here are a few ideas. So having your wedding during the off season, so wherever you're living, generally spring, summer weddings, when it's warmer, when you can get outdoors, when people may have more time off, or on a weekday as opposed to a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, may mean that certain vendors have lower package prices in place. You could consider an all-inclusive venue that includes your catering, your bar, and your decorations. This can save you time in sourcing and paying for and coordinating all the individual aspects of your wedding, but also can save you time. You could buy your dress during a sample sale, or you could buy a pre-owned dress. In episode 25, Five Smart Things to Do When You Buy a Pre-Loved Wedding Dress, I chat with Felicia about her experience with Still White. That may be an option for you. Let's face facts. You've always been the planner and the organizer, and your fiancé's eyes glaze over a little when you start talking about the details of your wedding day. But you really need someone to share this all with, to bounce ideas off, and someone who's not going to ruin the surprises, but also be supportive and maybe even offer a different perspective. So when you're needing to get a second opinion about your bridesmaid, your in-laws, or your first dance song. Unbridly Couples is your safe space. Unbridly hosts a private Facebook community where modern engaged couples can share ideas, chat, and solve problems, and generally just get freaking excited about their wedding. We also have a curated list of experienced wedding vendor professionals in there to offer suggestions and tips insight into how to get the most out of your big day, but with no unsolicited DMs or pushy sales tactics. It's just not what Unbridly is about. So you can search for the Unbridly Couples Group on Facebook or just click on the link in the show notes. I'll see you in there. You could make the choice to serve buffet style or family style as in plated and placed in the centre of tables reception food instead of plated meals, you could just have a smaller wedding. One of the quickest ways to cut down your expenses is to literally reduce your wedding guest list or even consider a micro wedding, which is more like 20, 30 people or eloping. Just you and your fiancé, your witnesses and your officiant or celebrant. You could have a look at a non-traditional venue If you consider having your wedding at a unique location like a public park, a museum, or even a family member's backyard if it's big enough, these non-traditional venues can be more affordable than traditional wedding venues and they often come with more flexibility for personalisation. But in that case, you also have to consider the things that you need to bring in. So if you've got a backyard wedding, for example, this can also mean having to bring in everything that would normally be in a restaurant. So you need to consider your food preparation areas, cooking, refrigeration, toilets, tables, chairs. So yeah, that could also come down on the side of false economy. You need to be careful. You need to consider all of those expenses. You could serve a signature cocktail instead of having a full bar. Instead of having three, four, five, six different spirits, you could have a signature cocktail plus your beer, wine and soft drinks. This will save you money on the cost of alcohol and also simplify your bar service. You can go paperless. You can consider sending electronic invitations, so emails and messages and notifications instead of traditional paper invitations. This can save you money on printing, postage and other related costs and is also potentially more environmentally friendly. You can DIY your decorations. It depends on your propensity for being creative and how much you actually enjoy that because there is no joy in deciding that you and your friends and family are going to get to your wedding venue the day before, spend the entire day putting things up and spend your wedding day then completely exhausted 
and looking around at the things that you didn't get to. That is the definition of a false economy. But if you are creative, you're little Martha Stewart, n- not in jail, but, you know, with that need to express yourself creatively, you can DIY your wedding decor. You could create centerpieces for reception tables. You could have a go at floral arrangements, although, God, I'd love to tell you about mine, but we don't have time just now. I did my own bouquets and, in short, disaster. Honestly, if that's your calling, knock yourself out, save the dough, but know that your time and your lack of experience in doing these things is going to be the true cost. You can rent or hire instead of buy. So you could hire items like your chairs, your linen, your tableware, your furniture, all those sorts of things, rather than buying them outright. Now, this can save you money on the upfront cost of purchasing, but also on the storage and maintenance, delivery, taking away. You've got to really consider who's going to store these for the next 12 months, who's going to deliver them, set them up, Who's going to pack them up at the end of the night, take them away, store them again, and then I'm guessing you might want to sell them. So if you're choosing to buy these sorts of items and you plan to resell them later, you are committing a fuckload of time and mental energy to this. What is that worth to you? I love the idea of choosing a wedding venue that's already beautiful, that has outdoor options if the weather's fine, indoor options if it's not. And you'd be happy with either or. This is going to save you money on decorations. If the space is already beautiful, pleasing, it's in the style of the wedding that you're trying to create, it's a canvas that makes creating your wedding so much easier. Having a more casual wedding may mean that you, as the couple getting married, and or your guests, may be able to wear things that are already in your wardrobe. This is way more sustainable than buying a single outfit that gets worn once. Choosing to have your ceremony and your reception in the same place means less travel. You're not hiring those wedding cars. You're not having to fly to get to somewhere. It's going to reduce your carbon footprint. It's going to be more eco-friendly. It's going to reduce your costs and it's going to reduce your time in travel. You literally get more time with your guests. And I'm hoping because, you know, I've helped you with building your guest list. I'm hoping you actually fucking like them and you want to spend time with them. And to that point, keep your guest list small. Honestly, if you wouldn't go out tonight and buy them dinner, I don't want to see them on your guest list. I'll be very disappointed in you. Also, no plus ones. If you haven't met this person, why the fuck do they have an invitation to one of the most expensive celebrations you'll ever put on. No plus ones. Forget about it. You could opt for a morning-afternoon celebration rather than an afternoon-evening one. The thinking of this is sometimes venues will charge a lesser fee if you're not there for the night. It means getting in and getting out is easier. But here's the kicker. People eat and drink less (laughs) during the day than they do at night. So that can be super handy. So you could do lunch instead of dinner. You could skip your wedding party. Skip it. If you don't have specific people wearing allocated taffeta dresses in the same colour and having to wear the same shoes and having to have their hair put up a certain way, it means you save money, you save time and you save your wedding party from the humiliation. They don't want to stand up the front with you. They don't. They really don't, but they want to support you and be by your side. So have them with you on the morning of rituals, celebrations, going out dress shopping, having your hens night, whatever it might be, but don't make them wear the same clothes and don't make them stand up the front with you. It's going to reduce your costs, your stress, and you might actually be able to keep your friendships intact as well. Another often overlooked but incredibly simple way to save everything, save your money, save your time, save your sanity, uh, actually still keep your job, still sleep at night, still have a great relationship with your fiancé, is to hire a wedding planner. Not all wedding planners are created equal. 
I understand. And everyone has a horror story, an urban myth story about the wedding planner who, you know, didn't have a clue, rocked up late, didn't care, was a bit laid back, lackadaisical, who didn't actually know what they're doing. And this comes down to due diligence in finding someone who is experienced and recommended and insured. But the idea is their years of experience are now your years of experience. So if they have built great relationships with wedding vendors and they can call them at a moment's notice or they can solve problems that come up, if they really care about what they do, it's going to save you. It's going to absolutely save you in more ways than one. You want to avoid the trends and you want to go classic. So it's the whole supply and demand situation. If everyone wants a white arched ceremony arbor, for example, there are only so many white arched ceremony arbors available where you live or, you know, close enough to be delivered on any given Saturday. So once all of those are booked out, you are going to be paying a premium to get that to get it from elsewhere, to pay the extra for delivery, whatever it may take, or someone to make it for you. That's when costs can really slip out of control. And especially if you're making these purchasing, hiring, renting decisions late. If you are going to have a wedding party, you could ask your bridesmaids to wear something they already own in a colour scheme that you choose. They could complement each other, but there is no need to go out and get a brand new outfit. You could hire a suit for sure, but the caveat there is I've seen a lot of hired suits. So you need to beware of the poorly fitting, the not dry cleaned or mended ones. You know, the buttons are missing. I remember one groomsman, he put his hand into the pocket of his suit jacket and there was a used tissue in there and it wasn't his. Ew. (laughs) Ripped seams, wrong sizes supplied. You want to get a suit hiring company that comes highly recommended. You also want to be picking these up super early and double checking everything. So to wrap this up, I would highly, highly recommend, number one, start small. Keep your guest list as small as you can to be happy. Keep your venue as small as you can to keep you happy. You can always add things as you go. Number two, spend on the things that mean the most to you And number three, stay focused. Set your budget at the start for sure. But as you start adding on the different wedding vendors, your different products, your different services, your outfits, things are going to change and things are going to shift. So you'll need to come back perhaps every couple of months and go, okay, where are we at? Is this still what we absolutely want? And are we heading in the right direction? Because at any time you may need or want to shift course slightly and that is a way better situation than getting to the end and realising that you don't have the money or you're just so fucking over it that you don't know if having this wedding is worth it. Your marriage, for sure. The wedding, uh, I've heard that from a few people and that might be a time to go, okay, we need to pull back, we might need to prioritise ourselves and or change what we were going to do, how we were going to celebrate. And there is no shame in that. So much better to know this up front than to get so deep that there's no turning back. I hope this has helped. I know it's a little bit heavy. I hope these tips have been helpful. And that your wedding day should be about celebrating your love and commitment to each other and the people who are around you and your relationships. It's not about the amount of money that you spend. That about wraps it up for this episode of the Umbradley podcast. For the links and resources we mentioned, please head to the show notes. And if you love the show, please review and subscribe on the podcast platform you're on now so you don't miss out on a single episode. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, weddings are a team sport. Catch you soon.